All right, hey everyone, this is Mick again from Brutalitopia along with my cohort, Durf. Say hello, Durf. Hello, everybody. <laughs> we are here in Chicago again, obviously, outside of Double Door here, and probably one of the wussiest storms we've encountered in a long time, although everyone was saying it would be the worst in a while. Yeah, but the internet lied to us. That's true, it did, but that's besides the point, because right now we're here uh, with Chris Letchford, the lead guitarist of Scale of Summit. Chris, um, you guys are currently on tour with Intronaut and Mouth of the Architect. Tell us, um, just to start things off here, how the tour overall has been for you guys. Uh, it's, it's been great. Uh, we're only about, I think, seven shows in. Kind of started this one on the West Coast. Usually we always end on the on the West Coast uh, instead of starting. But yeah, we started on West Coast in Portland and the Seattle, and then we played uh, five shows in Canada, and here we are in Chicago. And it's um, we were just talking about this actually before we started the interview. It's kind of... Um, Durf and I know it's kind of an interesting lineup as you guys are kind of more progressive, obviously instrumental, whereas uh, Mouth of the Architect and Intronaut are kind of more of the sludgier, more kind of ambient side of things. Um, kind of your thoughts on that and kind of the different crowds that have been coming to the shows that you've uh, experienced, perhaps something different than you've encountered before? Well, definitely a different crowd. Um, obviously, us at Intronaut, we still tour with a lot of the same bands, so we still share a lot of the same crowd, but for the most part, I mean, it's kind of cool because we draw our own crowd, they draw their own crowd, then we mix them together. But I, I love the flow of it because, like you said, you know, Mouth of the Architect is more down tempo, I guess you could say, and layers. I've been listening to them for years. I mean, I bought their CD, uh, one of their CDs, like over 10 years ago now, you know, and then they kind of disappeared for a while and then they came back. So it's kind of cool that they got to be on this tour with us. Um, so it's kind of a cool mix to go from them to us to Intronaut, you know, a nice flow and mixes it up. It makes it eclectic, but not too weird to freak everybody out to where it's over the top. So it's, it's been it's been cool. Is it is it weird being, um, it's kind of a two-part question, is it weird being the only instrumental band on this tour? Or do you ever find any kind of uh, stigma with being an instrumental band that uh, uh, kind of, disassociates from fans or anything like that or do you feel it's a uh it's beneficial or i guess what are your thoughts on being an instrumental band on a tour with uh bands with with vocals it's been like that forever so <laughs> i'm trying to think if we've ever toured with oh i guess besides trial escapes but that was a really short tour um as far as full tours we've never toured with only you know other instrumental bands besides that um, we have nothing. We have no problem with it, but I know like a lot of instrumental bands don't like to tour with other instrumental bands. For us, we used to start. We used to think when we first started that it was actually going to halter our progress being instrumental, but it's actually the reverse because there's no such thing as a universal singer. And you know, if you ever listen to a band, like the music is one thing, but the singer will be that final thing where like I like it or I don't like it for most people. So for with us, uh, you know, for instance, like my parents, I always use as an example. Like my parents would never listen to my band if we had a screamer. Ever, you know, but the fact that it doesn't matter how melodic her music is, how pretty it is, whatever, how uh, catchy it is, it wouldn't matter if they had someone screaming at them. So, and but the same thing goes for a singer. Like you can have an incredible singer, but still his tone will, you know, halter people. Like, oh, I don't like it, or I do like it, whatever. So it's actually worked more in our favor. And there's a higher percentage of people that would be more into us because we don't have a singer, and then it also lets us do a lot of split genre touring where we don't have to tour with just you know, metal bands because we have a screamer or prog bands because we have someone's like, whoa, you know, kind of <laughs> singing. So it, it works in our favor and it's, it's, it's cool. Like I think it helps us too because we definitely stand out, you know, it's, there's, without having any vocals. Um, on that note, um, kind of in terms of tours and everything, I haven't, I can't say I've ever seen one actually, um, but is there perhaps a lineup of purely instrumental bands that you guys would be interested in doing or has that thought ever crossed your guys' minds at all or... Well, we want to do another tour with Treescapes because the two weeks we did with them were so fucking awesome that it was just ah, like it was just it was so much fun. Like Dan's such a like awesome dude, and the rest of his band, uh, Walter and Matt, are, are great. And uh, so we'd like to tour, like do a full proper U.S. Canada tour with them, or even you know a full European tour or something. But uh, I mean, we obviously have to sometime tour with Animals as Leaders. I mean, that's like unavoidable as far as like how many times I'm asked, when are we going to tour with Animals? Sure. And I always just tell them, tell Tosin, because I mean, there's no other way around it. Like, I don't know if it'll ever happen. I mean, I hope it does. Like, we have no problem with touring with other instrumental bands, but um, I mean, we obviously share like a lot of the same fans. So it would, it would make sense and it would make for one just all instrumental tour. And I think it'd be be cool. Um 
And we're also trying to tour later on uh, with Evan Brewer's trio as well, oh, nice. since he's going to be doing like his new CD with uh, two bass and uh, drums. So that'd be cool. So regardless, um, I mean, we don't we don't mind, but that would be probably like, the ultimate. Or if you know, Liquid Tension Experiment could do something. Oh, yeah. That would be just <laughs> that's high hopes. Obviously. Have they even like talked about doing anything lately? I haven't well, heard anything from that camp in a long time. Well, I mean, obviously, um, I don't know if they. Real, if they're you know talking to each other anymore sure, since it's right. technically yeah, por- Portnoy's pro- project yeah. you mm-hmm. know but he can't he can't do it with anybody else he's got to do it with with JP and right. 2011 and sure. and Rudis you know I just but those like I mean those are like some of my favorite all times and then we've also in the past talked about touring with Guthrie Govan you know but I want to tour with like his solo stuff mm-hmm. I mean Erotic Cake's like one of my favorite Virtuoso albums so and then obviously we'd love to tour with Steve Vai and Joe Satriani. Those are the obvious ones. Right, right. But I think an Animals tour like needs to happen. Um, I don't know what's going to take it to push it over the top to make it happen, but <laughs> one day, hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully it's this interview. <laughs> well, yeah, if, if we've learned anything, it's that the internet can make things happen. Um, like so the I, supercell storm that was... Like the super... Yeah. yeah. You know, <laughs> well, okay. So internet other than weather forecasting... <laughs> Um, before we move away from this this topic of uh, instrumental and whatnot, because we've got some other things I know we want to ask you, is there any um, any vocalist working today that if if that person came to you and said, "Hey, scale the summit, I want to do vocals for your next album," that you guys would unequivocally say, "All right, we'll change everything. You can do vocals. We'll write lyrics." I mean, is there anybody right now working that could do that? And if not today, then anybody in history, just for the sake of questioning. No. <laughs> you know, there, no, there's some singers that I would love to do a band with, but I wouldn't want to alter, like, what we're doing with Skeleton Summit because, like you said, we'd have to change the way Word. we write. Word. Everything would have to be reorganized and written to leave room for a singer. We're not just going to take what we have now and just, you know, throw vocals on top. But um, two guys now, obviously Freddie Mercury, you know, for past, but to present... Uh, the Rain Akindo singer and uh, the singer of Carnival are probably like my two favorites because I wouldn't really want screaming. I'd want just singing, but I think those two have uh, like obviously incredible vocals, but they also have like a great tone, like a very unique tone. You hear it, you're like, okay. Um, so that would be cool. But yeah, it would, I mean, it obviously probably won't happen for scale. Like we've had a lot of people ask us, you know, if we would do like a guest song and I just think it would be confusing to fans to be like it's different than doing like a guest guitar solo because it doesn't really change your sound drastically and who knows like maybe it could backfire on us people would like it so much where we'd be forced to do like a full vocal album but it's just never been something in, that we've been interested in plus we've been this is our fourth record now we're kind of like in the zone as far as like how quickly we can write and how we all like you know work with each other it's going a lot smoothly compared to the past so Going on that, of course, mentioning the fourth album, you guys are kind of more heavily, especially from the show we just saw, um, touring more of the new album, The Migration, that literally just came out yesterday. Um, kind of your thoughts on the album overall and how it's perhaps different from the past three albums. It's our most aggressive record we've ever written, for sure. And it's really hard to record aggression. It doesn't matter, you know, because you're not on stage, so you're in a studio sitting in a chair and a metronome's cooking away, so it's kind of hard to kind of get your emotion into it I guess you say but uh, Jamie King helped capture that the biggest thing that we were focusing on was like we always perfect our songs where we go in the songs are done we don't actually write in a studio we go in and just hit record and start but our thing was we wanted like more of the organic natural sounding production not overly compressed flat you know every, there's not as many I mean the record has the past records have dynamics but this one definitely has more dynamics because of just the production alone kind of capturing the songwriting the way that it should be and he, I mean he nailed it man I just I don't see us doing records with anybody else now just because he he got it when we got in he's like okay but you know a lot of engineers will say okay but in their mind he, you know maybe not thinking of the same thing but um, as, uh, in terms of that like we've also like evolved as songwriters too just I don't know how to how to say it. I mean we're just growing older just in general as humans I guess and <laughs> hopefully progressing in the the right direction but I I love the songs like the songs the newer songs like if I had my way we'd be playing all new songs and no old songs on this tour and I just I want to play them there's so many songs that we didn't get to play tonight from the new record that I would have loved to have uh, played instead of older songs but um we obviously have to include the older ones but yeah as far as the new record just more aggression the perfect production and then just the songwriting is just developing and maturing, I guess you say. So 
in, in keeping with that, the new record, obviously, The Migration. Um, maybe I'm reading too much into this. Please feel free to tell me if that is, I am. But uh, Migration suggests kind of a, a one-way journey. The first track off the album, Odyssey, you know, obviously Homer's epic, you know, of, of Odysseus going home. It suggests a lot of thematic elements of travel. And when I had the Traveler, the last song on the album, was that something that you guys consciously uh, brought to the recording and the writing process? Or am I just a, a crazy fan who smokes too much pot? <laughs> Um, well, when we, I, I named, I think, all the tracks. Actually, my girlfriend actually helped me name all the tracks on this record. Um, since I handled like, most of the songwriting, the songs are kind of done. I'm like, okay, what do you see? I always like to get her opinion. Like, what do you see when you listen to this? And um, we would just kind of like brainstorm ideas and stuff. I don't pick a word and write to it, even though this time we kind of picked the cover art and wrote to that. Because the cover art was actually done before I was actually completely finished with the record, which was kind of cool because I told the artist, I was like, look, this is perfect the way it is. Now I'm going to finish writing the record to fit around that, that theme of the, the walking tree beasts. And um, as far as like travel, traveling and kind of like adventures and epics and journeys and whatnot, I mean, we've always had the adventure metal. So we always like to keep like the nature themes in there and just you know themed around things that are epic i guess but not that literal obviously like we try and keep them a little bit less direct you know more indirect and take from there speaking of the cover art can you please speak to whoever it was who did uh the awesome goddamn tree beasts because (laughs) since that cover art came out i've been talking to mick about just how i've been calling them tree dinosaurs (laughs) And just about how cool, like, it would be to see, like, a movie of them traveling to to this album. So, can you talk a little bit about that, about who came up with that? Yeah, it's, uh, his name's Duncan Store. I want to say he's in his 60s from Ireland. And I've always been a fan of Roger Dean's art, who did all, all the Yes records. Mm-hmm. And that's what I've always wanted, but we can't afford him. It's, like, five grand or something for just a cover. And uh, so I'd love, obviously, to have uh, Roger Dean do something. But so he, Duncan, hit us up just randomly. He heard Gallows from the collective, and he loved. It. He's like, I've been painting your music. Check out my artwork. But we get that a lot. We get a lot of like, Hey, I do art. Hey, I do art. Just like we do with Hey, I do music. You know, same thing. Like we used to promote our band, and uh, we obviously don't get to check it all out. But this guy, um, you know, he's in his 60s. So I'm like, okay, my dad's like a fine art painter. So I'm like, okay, this guy has to be legit you know and um looked him up and just blown away i was like you have to do artwork we got to work it out financially whatever we need to do if it's prints you keep the original whatever whatever it is and um when he sent me the the tree beast i was like that's perfect and there's also the flip side the poster that goes into the vinyl is part of the series that he was doing with the tree beast and so we got both of those a slightly different but the one i picked for the cover was just my personal favorite of the two and um, he uh, did it all watercolor as well. A lot of people don't know, and um, and then just did a high dens- density scan of it. But yeah, I guess does that answer your question? I'm sorry, I went on a rant, but he just does amazing stuff, and I, I couldn't get over it. And I was so excited. I wanted to show people for over a year. Like we had it for like over a year before we even entered the studio because the record was pretty much done. And uh, I, there's no way we're gonna ever top that art ever. Which, which sucks. I mean, you say that with music, too. I never thought we'd ever top Collective, and I think we definitely topped it with a migration. I'm really stoked about it. But with artwork, I mean, we've never had artwork this good, and I wish we could just ride out this record for, like, 10 years so we could just keep enjoying hanging our banner up with that amazing artwork. But he, uh, yeah, I mean, I hope hopefully we can have him do some stuff for the next record after this, you know, two years from now. So Yeah, I... I mean, that answers it perfectly. It wasn't really a, a question. It was more of just a, holy cow, this is fantastic. And it, it, from the second you guys released that that artwork, it was just, it was wow. So, yeah, I just, I, I personally wanted some background of that, and I figured maybe somebody else did too. So, Mick, maybe you should ask a question now so I stop sure. ranting about tree beasts. Um, kind of one thing I've uh, wondered over kind of the past year or so after listening to you guys more um, intently, um, kind of being from Chicago here, naturally we're kind of a little more 
uh, diehard fans of Russian Circles and Pelican, um, kind of more instrumental music that's a little more doomier, kind of a little more gloomier in a way, is a little more down-tuned. Um, for you guys, over the course of your records, kind of seem to have more of a, kind of like you said, an aggressive kind of uh, tone, but it's also kind of very vibrant and kind of uplifting. Um, what would you, um, what influences for you guys kind of mixes into that, would you say? Uh, I mean, I don't want to say no one really, but when whenever I'm writing the music, I don't really listen to a lot of music for like months at a time, where because subconsciously obviously that stuff will come out you know as far as uh melodies and whatever it's kind of hard like i remember i remember writing one riff i'm trying to think which riff it was but i swear it was on a mashuga record so i went through their entire catalog i was like i'm gonna find it i know it's in here it wasn't in there it's bizarre it's bizarre it's bizarre i was like i know this is a mashuga riff and not not the whole gent thing or whatever um I can't remember what it was. It's the only ginty part on the whole record that people say is narrow salient, but it, was, it wasn't that riff. There was another riff that I, I could have sworn was a Meshuggah song, but it wasn't. So I just like to stray kind of away from that, and I just write what comes out and what comes out, and I've written a ton of stuff that I've written clean, and then we just add distortion to it. So it's just it's something weird that I've always done. I've just kind of just write so that way it sounds more like, you know, me and the guys versus, you know, other bands. But, I mean, the most influential thing with me when it comes to writing is just like good weather so like today i would not be writing (laughs) interesting that's that's pretty fascinating to hear actually that like something like weather would be that um influential this is going to sound like a a go for it possibly a ridiculous (laughs) question but uh just watching you again this is the first time i've ever seen you guys live uh just now and the way that you play guitar and just kind of like the double tapping on the the fretboard i've i've never seen anyone do that before so is that something that you kind of just stumbled upon to make the sounds that you did is that something that you took away from something else i mean like that's i i was blown away by that i'd never seen anything like that before yeah when we first started uh, I mean, obviously everyone starts out with like the single note Van Halen stuff and we just kind of started doing multiple fingers, just adding it in there by ourselves. And um, then like years later, after we had already released like two records, like we discovered like Andy McKee, Antoine DeFour, they're acoustic guitar players that, that do the multi-finger tapping. It It's similar, but yeah, we just kind of just added more fingers. And then since then, you know, like th- those guys like keep me on my toes because they're incredible i have to search them later if you don't know but yeah, they're incredible players so it's not to say that no one influences us either because like guthrie govan keeps me on toes because i want to be able to you know keep my chops up because obviously i think he's the best guitar player alive um but yeah as far as the multi-finger tapping we just kind of just when we were at mi me and travis just did it our first song ever that we wrote was wrote on a horseback um i think it's the opener of monument i don't remember sure? our first record but <laughs> yeah. um yeah, that song is like the first song me and Travis ever wrote together, and that was the first one where we uh, implemented like I think mostly like octave stuff and a couple other two-handed harmonies and stuff like that. And then from then on out, the Great Plains like really solidified that sound, I guess, where we were like, man, this is awesome and a lot of fun to play, and people seem to dig it. So we kind of went on, and I wanted to write kind of like a part two to that, which was Levitated, and then after that was Atlas Novus, where I kind of wanted to kind of keep it going but keep progressing as far as like dynamics and you know adding a little bit more technicality and stuff like that um in terms of kind of that more technical side of things um another curiosity question um i've seen paul masvidal also kind of play this kind of guitar where it doesn't have a head on it um is there exactly like an advantage to playing a kind of guitar like that i'm not exactly sure on the the logistics of what is the advantage of that kind of guitar um, yeah, Paul actually started out playing the Steinberger guitars, and uh, we're actually both playing Strandberg now. Like, I went with Strandberg, they released my signature model uh, for a seven string, and then they announced uh, Masvidal's six string version. Of his, I mean, it's completely different guitars. Obviously, his has like a tremolo and the Endurneck on it and stuff, and uh, mine's seven string, hardtail, uh, longer scale, fan frets, C shaped neck, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, there's no real benefit to this. Other than more of, I guess, just the way that it looks. Like, we like the way that it looks, and 
it's obviously weighs next to nothing, so my back never hurts when we're playing because uh, I've got obviously heavier ones. But it, you wouldn't be surprised how much weight you lose when not having the tuning pegs on there alone since those are usually solid steel. But uh, there's no real benefit to it. But, yeah, he, I mean, he, he obviously been playing the headless ones for a long time. I've always wanted one since I ever started since I started playing guitar as a kid, but no one made a seven string version. I always wanted a seven string version of it. So then we stumbled when I stumbled across uh, Strandberg, like I think four or five years ago now, I uh, just approached him about making the seven, and he said sure because I mean he the way his bridges are built, you can go infinite amount of strings if you wanted to. Um, so it's cool that we're working together now and and both have signature guitars with him, which is an honor. Obviously, I love Cynic. We've toured with him two times now. Mm. So, yeah, honor to be, like, a part of anything that guy's doing. Sure. <laughs> so you mentioned Atlas Novus, and it, when I first heard that song, um, it made me feel feelings that I didn't know could be felt. I probably, from the day that song started streaming, I listened to it at least once a day until the album came out. Uh, and just, holy God, man, it's, it's an incredible song. So I guess again, and I feel like in tune with all of my questions, just kind of how did that song come together? Was it the the opening riff that started out? Was it one of like the middle pieces? Like, how did you guys build that song that made me want to climb mountains and fight bears and uh, live life. like live <laughs> life and ride gazelles naked and <laughs> other things? That's cool, actually. Like, um, I had a lot of my family like my mom and my girlfriend and stuff uh tell me that that video made them teary-eyed when the emg playthrough went through i was like oh that's interesting it's like it it kind of has its sad moments i guess but it's still happy especially in the beginning but it did start with the technical riff mm -hmm. in the very beginning of the song and then kind of like led from there i guess um i don't know i mean i just like i said when it comes to writing i just sit down and do it which sucks because i get so many questions asking how i ride or tips on riding but Man, for me, knock on wood, it's just I sit down and do it. And what comes out, comes out. And Atlas Novus was just one of those ones where I was like, I, I want to write another, like, almost, is almost all tapping. For the most part, I think, between me and Travis, I think one of us is constantly tapping throughout that entire song, except for maybe a couple riffs. But it's just a more chilled out dynamic. You know, it's the most delay we've ever used in a song. Like, we usually create the delay between the two, but I just happen to write, like, a cool patch on our fractals that... I was like, this will be cool to write something, and sure enough, it made its way into that song. But that's cool that the the motion part of that, because people always talk about how, oh, with lyrics, you know, you, well, you're not, you don't have anything to say. It's like, well, we're actually saying a lot by not saying anything. I would definitely agree with that. I think that uh, I, I I would agree with you saying that you have a lot of things to say. I would disagree with anybody who says you can't say anything without emotion. Um, I could rant, like Mick has heard me <laughs> rant on this song just since it debuted. Like I, I, I love it. I am, I am <laughs> unable to speak objectively on the song Atlas Novus. It, it's fantastic. I mean, you want to, we can talk about whales. I can talk about that objectively <laughs> if you want, I guess, for journalistic purposes. But, uh, but yeah, no, it, it's a tremendous song. And I, I like, I like hearing about that. And I like hearing that, uh, I'm not the only person to come up to you. Uh, and talk about the emo although I, it, I might be the only person outside of your family to talk about the emotional <laughs> aspects. Maybe that's kind of weird. So, uh, yeah, Mick, save me. <laughs> sure. Um, moving forward here, um, obviously you guys are kind of still a little in the midst of this tour. Um, is there anything else planned for you guys past this? Anything you can announce technically or anything? Yeah, we're playing Yes Festival in New Jersey, Yestival? which, oh, man. <laughs> You have no idea. I mean, I love, I love Yes. I mean, like, from what I can remember first hearing music as like a little kid was Yes, Stevie Ray Vaughan, sure. Johnny Winter, Buddy Guy. But Yes, like, is one that I still love to this day. You know, obviously, like, I turned 29 later this year and still, you know, from just being a kid, you know, uh, just it's an honor to play with him and just be able to just share the stage with him. Sure. So it's going to be, it's going to be a lot of fun. Like, even, even Mike Portnoy took notice and, and emailed saying congrats on Yes Fest because I sent him the new record. And uh, I was like, man, you know, because those guys are obviously huge right. Yes fans as well. So it was, it was cool just to, you know, it's obviously a big deal to, to play with him. So it's it's exciting. We're going to be playing two 20-minute sets. I don't remember the date, but it's like the first week of August in Camden, New Jersey. Cool. 
Um, well, I guess to wrap things up here, um, obviously we always like to leave things on a lighter note. And the last time I happened to interview you, you did predict the correct winner of the Final Four. Um, currently, the Blackhawks and the Bruins are playing right now. When we left downstairs, they were in their third overtime, and Intronaut was just starting, so we had to race upstairs. We couldn't wait any longer to see Intronaut. Um, but if you had to predict in this best-of-seven series, Blackhawks or Bruins, and in how many games? <laughs> Not to put oh, you on man. the spot or anything. There's also no pressure, cause yeah. just because we're in Chicago. Like, Honestly, Mick and I don't really care. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I actually really don't know. I was watching a little bit because they had a screen on the outside of the venue when I was eating my dinner earlier. And uh, I don't know. Yeah, like the basketball, definitely a fan. Hockey, like, I mean, I went to a few games as a kid, but, you know, I honestly, I couldn't make a prediction. We can give you an, way. we'll give you an out. So Spurs heat. Yeah. Uh, oh, did you watch so the, uh, so it's two watch one. the Spurs <laughs> absolute decimation of the heat the you other know, night? It's really disappointing. I'm a huge LeBron fan. Really? And anyone who hates the guy, I, I mean, I understand we're in Chicago, but I mean, it's the same thing. Like, I, I think Derrick Rose is super arrogant when it comes to basketball. Just his face alone, like, shows it. <laughs> but I mean, the guy is like fucking that. good. Yeah. So who cares? Yeah. Like, Derrick Rose is awesome. I hope he comes back just as good as when he left. Sure. But <laughs> that being and so. people <laughs> saying that LeBron is like bad, blah blah. I mean, it's the same thing. The argument against oh, you know, Jordan was better, but Jordan had the perfect backups. Right. For you know, they had he had the perfect role players. Anyway, I obviously I want the Heat to win because I just don't like the Spurs and I never have. And thankfully we were in Canada and I didn't get to watch the. I haven't been able to watch the first three games. I haven't even seen highlights of the first three games. I know they're down two one now. Right. So, you, so that sucks. So you don't know that uh, Danny Green and Gary Neal just went absolutely ham on I, three pointers. I didn't know that. They okay. hit the record right. sixteen yeah, threes. Yeah, between yes. the two of them. Yeah, which is freaking nuts. I mean, obviously <laughs> pa- Popovich, like he, you know, he's a stellar coach, and those guys don't screw around when they're shooting their three pointers. They got their. Uh, Jump shots dialed in. But I still hope the Heat win, but it's not looking very good right now. Okay. They're not, obviously, they're not, Spurs, there's no way they're going to hit 16 threes in any of the games the rest of the series, most likely. Agreed. But, <laughs> but I just feel like LeBron's supporting Cass kind of like let him down. You know what I mean? It's like everyone's always like, oh, LeBron didn't do this. It's like, yeah, but look at everybody yeah. else. So what do they do? They failed, you know, when he'd give them like a stellar pass or something, they'd miss a layup or something, you know. It's like LeBron's not going to miss layups. You know, he's just going to dunk it on whoever. So hopefully hopefully the Heat win. I'm sure a lot of musicians that are listening to this could care less about sports. But, I mean, I was just playing uh, two-on-two, me and Mark versus uh, um, Intronaut and Mouth of the Architect yesterday in basketball. We lost, but that's because Mark has, like, not a clue of how to play basketball. <laughs> I play. I used to play five-on-five five, full court nice. up until, like, August uh, of last year. I had to finally stop because I had a muscle contusion in my leg. Then some guy nearly broke my nose. I mean, I was very competitive. I mean, it was full-on five-on-five five with, like, legit guys at my gym, and I finally had to quit. So, But as far as, like, musicians liking sports, it's a rarity. Like, I remember Prosthetic telling me that I was uh, the first person on their entire roster that was into sports. Wow. And, I mean, it, yeah. <laughs> He's like, yeah. yeah. So, so interesting enough, uh, yeah, I was having dinner with the owner when I was out there doing the EMG videos, and we were just talking about how the, how much I wanted the Warriors to beat the Spurs, but obviously, it's the Spurs, and yeah, I mean they at least made them work work for it. Steph Curry's fun to watch, man. He's great. I'm looking forward to watching Steph Curry for a long time. Oh yeah, I can't. I mean, I hope he can. Just his ankle just always seems like it's tweak, 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 tweak. So. I always feel bad. Growing up in St. Louis, I kind of just bounce around from year to year. We didn't have a basketball team, so yeah. it's just kind of like whoever whoever catches my fancy at the moment. Oh, yeah. Which... I mean, I love the sport. I don't really have a team. I mean, oh, I love LeBron, but, you know, I don't really have – even though I miss I miss watching him play with the Cavs. He was much more explosive and stuff. I miss those days. But um, I love watching OKC as well. Kevin Durant's like – just a machine, but they were they were just kind of, in my opinion, embarrassing in the playoffs this year. Yeah. Just not, I'm not sure what's going on. They should have never let Harden go. Oh, uh, they a beast. We could talk about we could talk about yeah. this for another yeah. 20 yeah. minutes. They should have never <laughs> traded Harden. He had another year left on his contract. Yeah. Anyway, we don't have to get on that topic. Anyway, for the few that are still listening, please yeah. go get the migration. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Absolutely, pick up the migration. Yeah, it's a fantastic album. Right, and we're here with Chris Lutchford from Scale Summit. Another Brutalitopia interview. Chris, thank you so much, and good luck to you guys on Thanks the rest so of the much. tour. Enjoy Thanks the rest for having of the tour. me. Yep. Thanks.